Hey, have you had the chance to check out C.L. Whiteside's The Non-Microwave Truth? I know I've told you about it before, but if you haven't checked it out yet, now is the time. He's got this genuine faith that encourages me every time I listen to him to check out The Non-Microwave Truth anywhere you listen to podcasts. We are continuing our May flower series with an episode titled, Look at the Lilies of the Field. And in fact, I want to go back to the wording that I learned many, 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 many years ago, which was consider the lilies of the field. Hey guys, it's Amber, wife, mother, warrior, type A child of God. Here at Little Things, we examine everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for joining me. I want us to consider a couple of concepts today based on this passage from Matthew chapter 6. So in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said this, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Okay, I want to consider a couple of different things with this passage. First of all, what is it that pagans or unbelievers run after? And how should we live life differently? Well, the unbelievers run after earthly things. And Jesus said again in Matthew 6, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Unbelievers worry about all kinds of worldly things. I need a house. How much house can I buy with my money? How can I fill it up with good things? How can I get better furniture? How can I get better appliances? How can I get new curtains? How can I tear down that wall and have a bigger, more open floor plan? And how can I get a better yard? filled with all the great things, the gazebo, the patio furniture, ta-da, 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 on and on and on and on. I need, I need, I need, I need a vacation. I need to travel. I need a break. I need a better job. I need more money. I need a good time. I need the man, the life, the flashy stuff. Stuff, 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 stuff. What are they running after? They're running after worldly things. Why? Because this is all they have. Jesus said, believers should be on a completely different trajectory because we are not seeking the stuff of the world. We are seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Yep, we need a place to live. But we don't need to spend every dime that we have. And we don't need to get a second job or a third job or work really hard to get a better job to earn more money so that we can get a lavish house and build our palace here on earth. Our houses are not going to last. Who knows if they will still be standing even in 50 or 100 years. Yeah, we need clothes and and we need food. But it's not our end all be all. These are necessities, but they're not what drive us. They're not what get us out of bed in the morning. They're not what we are seeking. Or are those the things we are running after and chasing after? Do we want to give our kids the best? Are we seeking to live a life of luxury and ease and comfort? 
I want to retire so I can sit on the beach. I want to be done so I don't have to work any longer in the church. I want to live a life of leisure. You guys go to work, but not me. Been there, done that. Now I've made enough money that I can get up on my own schedule. I don't need to help anybody else out. If you have listened to any of the behind the scenes podcasts with Pastor Mike, I did a podcast with him um, for the series in February, Churchy Words, and again in April for the What is Love sermon series. And we started talking about Luther's large catechism. Now, if you're not familiar, Martin Luther, the reformer, who really established the Lutheran church by breaking away from Catholicism, he wrote two catechisms. One was a large catechism, one was a small catechism. And if you've grown up in the Lutheran church, you're probably somewhat familiar with the small catechism. So it's the way that we teach our children the basic foundational truths in God's word. So the small catechism is set up as a series of questions that examine the commandments, um, baptism, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Prayer, the creeds. And Luther asks some questions, and then he answers them with scripture and explains what these concepts really mean. Well, the large catechism is somewhat less known. I'm in my late 40s, and I had never looked into the large catechism at all. And as Pastor Mike was explaining the differences in the catechisms and that the large catechism is the same basic information, but it's in an essay format, I asked him if he had ever read it. And he said, yeah, he had, and I hadn't. So he said, well, why don't you check it out? So I did. And let me just read to you an excerpt from Luther's large catechism talking about the first commandment. He said this, So you can easily understand what and how much this commandment requires. A person's entire heart and all his confidence must be placed in God alone and in no one else. For to have God, you can easily see, is not to take hold of him with our hands or to put him in a bag like money or to lock him in a chest like silver vessels. And says to have him means that the heart takes hold of him and clings to him. To cling to him with the heart is nothing else than to trust in him entirely. For this reason, God wishes to turn us away from everything else that exists outside of him and to draw us to himself. For he is the eternal good. It is as though he would say, whatever you have previously sought from the saints Or for whatever things you have trusted in money or anything else, expect it all from me. Think of me as the one who will help you and pour out upon you richly all good things. Where do you place your security? Is it in a well funded nest egg? A good paycheck? The government, which you assume is going to stay out of war, is going to keep you safe, is going to protect you from all the big bad things out there. Because if our security is placed anywhere but in God, then it is misplaced. And the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Do I even seek the kingdom of God or God's righteousness. So to break it down a little bit, our righteousness is to be declared not guilty. And that is done as we put our faith in Jesus. Jesus came to earth. He lived the perfect life that we could never lead. He lived a sinless life so that he was the perfect sacrifice. He gave his life up for us on the cross. He paid for our sins so that as we stand before God, the father, We are declared not guilty and allowed to live with God forever in heaven. Now, that is the righteousness that we get from Jesus. But what is it to seek God's righteousness while we are on earth? I just started reading Proverbs um, 1 today. I'm going through the Proverbs, I think, for the third or maybe fourth time in the last two years. 
And each time I've done it just a little bit differently, I've studied it differently, and I am loving the way I am studying it now. I, if you've listened to me at all, you know that I am going through now a prayer journal, and I'm using the Word of God to pray, and it is totally changing and opening up my prayer life. But anyway, Proverbs chapter 1 is about attaining wisdom and discipline. And the notes in the Concordia Self-Study Bible say that wisdom is skill in living. It's following God's design and avoiding moral pitfalls. What is God's righteousness? Verse 3 in Proverbs chapter 1 says this, it is for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair. There's that word right, righteousness. God's righteousness is doing what is right and just and fair in avoiding the moral pitfalls that God would allow us to avoid as we walk with him. In the book of Proverbs, we see three types of people. Solomon over and over and over uses these three types of people as examples and as lessons for us. There is the wise, there is the foolish, and there is the mocker. The wise are the people who fear God and want to live according to God's ways. The fools are those who say, there is no God. What are you talking about this God? And the mockers are those who are antagonistic towards those who love God. So you want to see God's righteousness? Read the book of Proverbs. Pay special attention to what Solomon says the wise do. It's all there. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. How much time do you spend in your Bible? In Bible study? Meditating on the things of God? Do you spend any time reading your Bible each day? How much time do you spend praying about the things of God? Praying for the lost, the straying, the people that you could influence. Do you seek? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek, look for, search out the things of God. Consider, consider, are you doing this? Now, the second thing I want you to consider from this passage about the lilies of the field is that Jesus said to us, do not worry. Therefore, because you know that God provides and everything that we need is known to God, therefore, do not worry. We have more than most people in the world, and our anxiety is through the roof. So how do we avoid this? Well, I'm going to suggest two things. And again, this isn't the end-all be-all. If you want to add something, please send me an email, shoot me a message, and I would be happy to consider your thoughts. Here are two things I came up with. Why do we carry things that we weren't meant to carry? And here's what I mean. Why do we try to solve things that we weren't meant to solve? Parents, we try so hard to run our children's lives. Even teenagers, young adults, adults, we try so hard to keep everyone healthy and prosperous and having them avoid problems. And how do we learn? So many times we learn by falling, right? Haven't your best lessons in life come through failure? I know mine have. Those are the times that when I was standing back up, I went, whoa, I don't ever want to do that again. Why are we trying to run politics, our government, to change things that we can't change? And I'm not saying that your voice isn't important. I'm not asking you to completely remove yourself from the political process. I think it's important that you pay attention to what's going on. I'm saying... Are you losing sleep at night 
because things aren't as you think they should be. Did God ask you to run the world? I know that he didn't ask me to, and I can, in my mind, micromanage myself into a frenzy, thinking that it is up to me to save the world. All that happens when I do that is I end up crazy and losing sleep and trying to run things I was never asked to run. Am I supposed to direct my church? Nope. No one asked me to do that. Am I supposed to be the neighborhood watch? And by that meaning, the person who tells this person that they're not doing a good enough job and this person has done this and that person, well, that's not fair. Is that my job? No. Am I supposed to be running around my city telling people how better they can live so that they meet my standards? No. Look, we are supposed to cast our anxieties on God because he cares for us. God didn't ask us and hasn't told us to run the world. He's doing a pretty good job. So here's what I think. I think we need to teach our kids to walk with Jesus and then let them walk with Jesus. I remember my mom saying, and I think she told me when my oldest was probably like 13 or 14, and I thought she was absolutely insane at the time. But she said, Amber, really, by the time your kids are about 16 years old, you've taught them all they need to learn. And now you need to let them do it and fail and falter while they're still in your house. And then you can show them, well, maybe that wasn't the best decision making. And instead, consider doing this. And I thought, are you kidding me? 16 year olds are not meant to make their own decisions and do everything they were meant to do and blah, blah, blah. I am now on my third child being 16. And I think my mom was on to something. Teach your kids to walk with Jesus. Teach them to go to the word for guidance and wisdom every day. Be in the word. Teach them to pray about the things that are before them. Let them go. Let them make the mistakes. Now, that doesn't go if they're, you know, doing something that could potentially kill them or that's really very foolish. That's clearly not what I'm talking about. But let them make their choices. Ask them why they're making those choices. Pray with them about it and then let it see where, see where it goes. And you know what? If it doesn't end up, up being the best thing, then help them make the decision based on what the consequence was. I tell my children all the time now, I'm not going to be here forever. My job is really to make sure that you know God because I want to be with you in eternity forever. So I'm not going to always be here to tell you what to do. And I don't know how many days God is going to give me to live. Because of that, I need you to just follow God, walk with God, pray to God, let him be a big part of your life, and then just live. And we'll both be in eternity forever. You can't cure what you can't cure. The person who is straying, whoever that is, whether it's one of your children, a spouse, your sister, a cousin, your neighbor, and it is breaking your heart. You know what? You thinking that you can somehow solve that is stealing glory from the Holy Spirit. There is one person and one person only who can bring that person back. It is the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean you don't say anything. It doesn't mean you don't pray for the person. Just you weren't meant to carry that. You weren't meant to walk around every day worried and bummed out because someone isn't living the way you think that they should live. Pray about them. Commit them to the Lord. Look for opportunities to speak to them about the word, the Lord and the word. And then leave room for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then you can give glory to the Holy Spirit when it happens. And the second part of not worrying is recognizing that my mom was right. Now, you don't know my mom. I'm sorry if you don't know her. She's a fantastic Christian, godly woman. But one of the things she always told me when I was growing up, again, that I didn't take very seriously at the time, but now I think she nailed it. She says, fear is of the devil. And over and over and over in the word, God tells us, do not be afraid. Why? Because nothing, nothing is impossible with God. We need to believe God who is who he says he is. 
He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the creator. I'm the sustainer of all things. He's our almighty God who loves us with an unfailing, compassionate love. Jesus said in our Matthew passage that he sees us. He knows our needs. So why do we call our friends to complain? And why do we search TikTok for answers? And why are we trying so hard for the perfect life when all we need to do is rest in Jesus, be immersed and saturated in him and let his aroma spread to everyone around us? I have seen how good Satan is at making us afraid. He will paralyze us with, with fear if he has a chance. But let me tell you something else I've learned. I've learned when you quit being afraid, you're fairly unstoppable. When you find courage in the Lord, there's not a whole lot that you are unwilling to do for the kingdom. Get up and talk in front of a group of people? Sure, why wouldn't I? I'm talking about God. And God is amazing. And have you read his word? Look at what he's done. Go see somebody's, you know, wayward son or daughter. Could you go talk to them? Yeah. Could you, you know, teach Sunday school, even though you think that, well, I'm not a teacher. Yeah, I could. You know why? Because I love the Lord and I want these kids to know the Lord. It is amazing when we quit letting fear dictate our lives, how much more we are able to do in the kingdom. It is just a tool of Satan. And it's so important for us to remember what Jesus said. Do not worry. Don't be afraid. Over and over and over in the Bible, we're told, do not be afraid. Seek God. Don't worry. That's what it comes down to. There's a meme that says, not once does the Bible say, worry about it, stress over it, or even figure it out. But over and over, it clearly says, trust God. I love that. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. Hey guys, I just want to take a minute to thank every single one of you who has taken the time to pray for the important work we're doing, or made a donation, or took the time to encourage any one of us at Time of Grace. I want you to know we appreciate you and we're thrilled to partner with you to bring the hope of the gospel to the world. 